This is Larry Jordan, the host of the Digital Production Buzz. The following interview is an excerpt from a recent program. To hear the entire program, visit digitalproductionbuzz.com. James Mathers is a veteran cinematographer and founder of the nonprofit educational cooperative, the Digital Cinema Society. It's always a delight having James on the show. Hello, welcome back. Uh, thank you, Larry. Thanks for having me. James, as we get ready for NAB, we're taking a look at the current status of our industry. So wearing your Digital Cinema Society hat, how would you describe what you're seeing today? Well, you know, um, uh, NAB is always a big deal for our group. Uh, we go up there and we shoot uh, interviews uh, to try to show what's new at NAB uh, to the people that can't make it, um, as, as I know you do as well. And um, uh, what I'm sensing in the industry right now is a lot of fear. Uh, there's fear uh, that the producers have, that they're not able to keep up with the technology, uh, that their material is going to be obsolete. Um, and um, there's um, fear from uh, equipment owners and facilities, owner operators like myself, all the way up to large rental facilities, um, that uh, they're not going to be able to amortize their investment uh, in this new gear before uh, the next big thing that the producers demand is going to come along. And uh, uh, the manufacturers uh, fear that they're not going to be perceived as having the latest and greatest, the next uh, cutting edge uh, uh, technology. So they're always trying to offer something new, something better. And at the same time, there's a lot of price pressure, so they have to make it cheaper. So uh, there's just a, a lot of fear going around, uh, and it makes people... Um, you know, reticent to invest in new equipment, reticent to, to move ahead. You know, that ties in with exactly what I'm seeing, is that not only is there fear, but everybody is sort of sitting back and waiting, which means that, that nothing's getting, I mean, it means that budgets are collapsing and, and we're all sort of chasing our tail, afraid of what's going to happen. Is that a, a, a true summary? I think it might be. I mean, I, I hope not, uh, because, uh, you know, that's the surest way to just freeze a whole economy, freeze the economy of our uh, industry. And uh, we will keep marching ahead. Technology keeps uh, improving, and uh, we want to utilize it. We want to utilize the best uh, tools. So um, I hope that, um, that things, uh, these kind of fears uh, ease and that people can uh, move forward in a you know in a rational way. Um, would you like to hear my analysis of how this sort of got started? I would love to hear your analysis of how this got started. I think um, th there's one word. Uh, it's a color. It's a company. Uh, red. I think uh, started this and and uh, don't get me wrong. I give them uh, a heck of a lot of credit for uh, you know coming up with uh, uh, the systems that they did and and really turning the industry on its ear. Um, and that, that did start a, a race in at least camera technology, which is what I follow the most as both a cinematographer and uh, for Digital Cinema Society. Uh, but RED um, were able to, I don't know if they seeded their uh, cameras or, you know, in some way or another, they persuaded these really top end filmmakers like Steven Soderbergh and Peter Jackson and uh, Ridley Scott and um, uh, David Fincher to use uh, their gear on some major motion pictures, which started winning Oscars and other awards for the cinematography and best picture. I mean, it really um, elevated the prestige of their uh, cameras. And meanwhile, they had a lot of uh, aspiring filmmakers and they were able to uh, convey the idea, I think, to these people that um, they could, for a fairly small investment, they could have the same tools that these top filmmakers were having. So suddenly you had uh, aspiring uh, filmmakers, and everybody's an aspiring filmmaker, uh, investing in these cameras. You had all the camera crew, camera assistants, you know, buying a camera so they could uh, move up, and you had actors and producers, I say, everybody and their dentist suddenly owned a red camera. And you went uh, from an industry that maybe there was uh, several thousand uh, cinema cameras uh, in the world, suddenly there's tens, several tens of thousands of cinema cameras almost overnight in the period from, say, uh, 2007 to uh, uh, 2009. Uh, since so many people had them, uh, that started to 
devalue the uh, rental that you could get uh, for them. And as I said, this a lot of aspiring uh, cinematographers would, you know, like throw in their camera if they could get hired to shoot a movie. And uh, and then uh, Red got outredded by um, uh, Black Magic Design. They came out with a less, even less expensive camera, more capable. And uh, Red kept coming up with more models and the other. Um, uh, camera uh, manufacturers, the large uh, multinational companies like Sony and Panasonic, and everybody was making these uh, high-end digital cinema cameras. Uh, Canon, of course, uh, came at it from the DSLR side, um, and that was a whole other part of the uh, revolution. So you had all these people bu buying cameras. They didn't always um, have everything they needed for a proper package, but they had a red package that they were able to make available. and. Um, I once read, wrote an article uh, how I spent a hundred thousand dollars on a seventeen thousand five hundred dollar camera, which that's because of the lenses and all the support gear that you need to, you know, to really make a professional uh, package. These other people didn't have it; they started using still camera lenses, but they were able to make some form of a movie. A lot of movies were made, and then there's a lot of indie, low-budget movies. So uh, that meant that the uh, the budget started coming down uh, for what was, you know, what people could expect to get uh, and for their indie movie. And um, a lot of them never saw the light of day. I mean, sure, they're on the Internet, maybe, and they might be able to be seen by millions of people. But if they don't get a proper uh, promotional release by uh, one of the major studios and with all the advertising and everything, nobody's ever going to know about it. Nobody's ever going to see these movies. Uh, so uh, it's sort of a whole cycle of devaluation and uh, there's a lot of people out there and a lot of them sit in closets and uh, yeah there's been a democratization where you know people can make a movie more easily now you could make a movie with your iPhone but it doesn't mean that uh, uh, they're going to be properly distributed and uh, and I think that that has sort of um, contributed to the the devaluation of equipment and then somehow those producers get the idea if they're not paying a lot for the equipment then they shouldn't pay a lot through so it's become a very difficult uh, way to make a living to work on indie movies like i used to for many many years well <clears throat> this gets to be so depressing i don't want to think about it because budgets <laughs> collapse to the floor and and you know it's it's the old argument that we had with dslr cameras just because you own a camera doesn't mean you know how to take a photograph that's right. what snapshots are all about. And it seems that the video industry has been trapped in this for the last several years where gear keeps getting cheaper and, and producers discount the expertise of the operator and feel that the operator's fee should go down as well. How do we fight this? I mean, it's easy to, to say, yeah, it's really depressing, because it is. But how do we fight it? How do we get past it? Um. I'm not sure what the answer is, and I hate to just uh, bitch and moan, uh, <laughs> as I have been doing. Um, and it's not to say that, uh, that I'm anything against um, better uh, camera technology. You know, I, I think we should still, you know, keep going and, you know, get the best tools that are available at our disposal. Like I said, filmmakers will use just about anything any tool they can get their hands on to make a movie, even an iPhone. Right? But if they can get better and better uh, quality, why not? And uh, that's the good side of it is that uh, all these tools are coming down in price and, uh, and uh, the uh, ability to um, uh, produce uh, higher quality images is uh, uh, getting to be more and more accessible. It doesn't mean that uh, you're a master craftsman because you own the camera but uh, it does at least allow you to have um, that ability. Um, say 4K, 4K is something that's a, the hot t topic. It was uh, anyway last year. This year I think it's gonna be HDR, but that's another uh, question. But 4K, uh, you know, it's great. 4K, you can uh, um, reframe, you can uh, stabilize. Uh, and then of course there's the big argument, archival value. Um, and it is uh, better. It's better to capture at the highest level you can possibly afford because, you know, it's the quality is just going to keep getting better. And if you want to uh, uh, have your um, uh, product, you know, accessible in years from now, um, then you better, you know, 
be in the best format you can. Uh, but I, I'm paraphrasing a funny uh, comment that I saw on a, uh, a CML recently. It said, uh, well, somebody commented, the best way to uh, maintain your archival value is to make something that people want to watch <laughs> in the future. <laughs> and uh, and that, that's really it. The content is king. And these are all just uh, tools to, you know, do the best you can. Well, you know, there's there's a philosophical question, and I also want to get your take on what's happening at NAB, but philosophically, is there much more that we can do with image quality? Because once image quality equals human sight, then really there's there's no advantage to an 8K or 16 or 32 or 2 million K because our eyes can't perceive the difference. Are we going to top out soon with what what image quality consists of? Well, um, you do raise some good points. Um, uh, there's um, a point of diminishing returns as far as keep as we keep increasing um, resolution. I should have mentioned another uh, big um, advantage of shooting at higher resolutions is that you, whenever you down res, you're always going to get a better image. So if you start with 4K or 6K, even though you're only delivering in HD, you're going to get uh, a better pro quality product. Uh, but then uh, it's limited by the size of the screen. Uh, if you're, you know, you have a 4K um, monitor uh, display and you get back more than a few feet, you're not really able to tell the difference between 4K and, and uh, uh, NHD. Uh, so unless the screens get bigger, then they can really fit into a house unless we <laughs> start making larger and larger rooms. Um, it's, there's really no reason to go much beyond uh, 4K for display. Maybe we could go 8K and, and more for uh, production to uh, take advantage of some of the things I said before. But I don't think that there's uh, any need to really go for display much beyond uh, uh, 4K uh, in the foreseeable future. What, do you th what are you looking at for NAB? NAB, I'm looking at um, uh, HDR, and that's what I was going to mention uh, next. I think that... Uh, um, the research has shown that uh, you can show somebody a, an HD image next to a 4K image and you can turn off the 4K and butterfly them and people really can't tell the difference, like I said, more than a few feet back. However, you butterfly an image of um, uh, 4K and then one that's 4K with, with uh, HDR and you turn the HDR off and people say, hey, what happened? <laughs> Why did the picture go so um, so squirrely? It's because they, they can really see and, um, and value um, the image improvement uh, that you get with, uh, with HDR. Um, now, HDR requires that, um, it's mostly a post-production effect, but you have to have a good camera. You have to have a camera with a lot of dynamic range and that has the ability to uh, capture that uh, um, kind of an image that makes it worthwhile to show in HDR. But all the, the top end cameras are, are there, you know, they're talking, you know, 15 stops at dynamic range these days, which is quite a bit. Where can people go on the web to learn more about the society? If they'd like to learn more, they can go uh, to www.digitalcinemasociety.org. That's our homepage. And for people that feel that you yourself need more projects to keep you busy, where can they go on the web to learn about you? Uh, well, the name of my business is Migrant Film Workers. A little takeoff of the Migrant Farm Workers, and uh, they can reach that at migrantfilmworkers.com. And James Mathers is the founder of the Digital Cinema Society and a cinematographer himself. James, thanks for joining us today. This has been fun. Thank you, Larry. It's always a great time with you. Take care. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. To stay connected and receive updates from The Buzz, sign up for our free weekly newsletter now. Or you can learn more about us on our website. And thanks for watching The Digital Production Buzz.